Good morning. I had to check my notes for that. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of East Aurora. We welcome all visitors to this haven for people of different beliefs but shared values. We welcome all races, ethnicities, genders, sexual identities, both those who are attending in person and those who are attending online. Here, we put our differences aside and celebrate all that brings us together. I'm Jeanette Geckler, I'll be your service leader. The church year is winding down, and this will be Peter's last sermon in this church year. He'll be back. We welcome you, as always. Peter's sermon title this morning will be White Privilege and a Bag of Chips. So this made national news. So I'm sure that you have heard the story as well. In late April, an eight-year-old African-American boy in Syracuse was arrested by the police for stealing a bag of Cool Ranch Doritos from a corner store on Syracuse's north side. In a city, I googled this, in a city which the latest census data ranks as having both the highest poverty rate and the highest child poverty rate in the nation, and also ranks as having one of the highest violent crime rates in the nation. In a city, this challenged. The police department somehow found the resources to send three white police officers to the scene of this so-called crime. I want you to think about that for a minute. Just think about that. Three police officers and at least two police cars that I saw in the YouTube video that I watched of the incident responded to the report of an eight-year-old child stealing a bag of chips. And the response was quick enough, think about this too, the response time was quick enough that they managed to arrive while the boy was still at the store. This means that the time that elapsed between when the 911 call was made and the arrival of the police had to have been two or three minutes. Anyone who has ever called 911 in a fairly large city knows just how impressive that response time is. I have called 911 several times over the years for much more serious problems than a stolen bag of Doritos. And I have waited far longer than that. And when help did arrive, I got one car, not three. The boy was grabbed by the collar, yanked from his bicycle, and essentially thrown into the back of a police car while sobbing hysterically, please, please, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. The incident was filmed by a bystander, an African-American man who repeatedly asked the police, why, why were they being so harsh? The man offered to pay for the chips, and he kept pleading with them to let the boy go. I'll walk him home. I know his family, the man pleaded several times. One of the police officers got right up in the man's face and shouted, Keep walking. You don't know anything. Stay out of this. It is very hard video to watch. And when I was preparing for this, I watched it several times. The boy is clearly terrified, and the police behavior is appalling. Rough, threatening, arrogant, rude, dismissive, absolutely no respect is shown to the child, no respect is shown to the bystander, and no respect is shown to the neighborhood as, as a whole. There's a lot of people in the video standing there watching. The police behave with the entitlement of people who enjoy complete immunity in spite of the fact that they knew they were being filmed by several people with phones. He looks like a baby, 
the bystander says. It's a bag of chips. You're treating him like a cold-blooded killer over a bag of chips. He broke the law. The cop keeps shouting at the bystander. What he did was against the law. He broke the law. As if really there isn't any difference between a child shoplifting a bag of chips and an adult committing a violent crime. And the sad truth is that there really isn't much difference in the treatment. That is, there isn't a difference if the child is black or brown. And that lack of difference applies not only to the police, but to the reactions of white members of the community as well. Just as I have ties with Buffalo, I have lived in Syracuse as well. I went to Syracuse University, and my first teaching job was in Syracuse. So I am familiar with the community, and I still have some friends there. One of them is Carol, a kind, generous, and politically liberal person who sat with me for five days while my mother was dying in a Syracuse hospital in 2013. Given what I know of Carol, I was, I must say, a little surprised that the day after this incident happened with the boy and the chips, she posted this to Facebook. Regarding the eight-year-old on video getting put into a police car for stealing a bag of chips, stealing is stealing. I don't care if it's a bag of chips or a bag of diamonds. The police gave him a ride home and they talked to his father. And then we get the father on TV saying, oh, my poor baby was so scared after he saw the video. Well, Carol continues, my baby would have been a lot more scared getting out of the police car at home. And then, she went on, we find out on the national news that this child was known to the officer. Hmm, so, not his first encounter. Consequences. Every action in life has consequences. So the first thing I did was suppress my urge to let her have it. As we have all learned by now, these Facebook showdowns are completely futile, and they only cause hard feelings. Carol has been a good friend for a long time, and as kind and as generous as she is, I also know about her that there is a certain degree of self-righteousness to her personality, and kind of a dogged stubbornness that comes out when she is challenged. So. Here it is. I'm going to say to you this morning what I wanted to say to Carol in April. Now, I don't doubt that she is right when she says that her baby would have been more scared getting out of the police car at home than he would have been at having been put in the police car in the first place. But I highly doubt that that ever would have happened to begin with. Carol's baby an only child, the one that her post refers to, is her blonde, high-achieving son, Alex. Unlike the boy who was arrested in Syracuse on the challenged north side, Alex grew up in Manlius, the Syracuse equivalent kind of, of East Amherst. Carol and her school superintendent husband, Bill, were both over 30 before Alex was born, so they were both well-established in their careers before they became parents. Alex grew up with every advantage that you can infer from this background. If, even if, at age eight, Alex had stolen a bag of chi chips from a store, do any of us here this morning believe that three police units would have responded in under five minutes, manhandled him, and taken him into custody? Think about it. What are the odds? Does any of us here this morning think that if a white suburban man was standing by saying, hey, I know that boy, I know his family, I'll pay for the chips, let me take him home, do we think that the manliest police would have gotten up in his face and said, keep walking, you don't know anything, he broke the law. 
and then thrown the boy into the police car right in front of him? Alex and the African-American boy who stole the chips live in different worlds with different rules and different rights. Yet Carol's Facebook page post takes none of these vast differences into account and simply assumes that the two situations would be identical. She assumes that even in the highly unlikely event that the police did bring Alex home, that it would simply have been a lesson well learned rather than an extremely traumatic event. Unlike the boy who stole the chips in the video, Alex would not likely have been literally afraid for his life. Unlike those of us who live in white privilege, children of color are well aware that any contact with the police, any contact, even incidental or even for incredibly minor infractions, can end in death. This boy in the video who stole the chips was well aware of this fact, probably more so than most. Because if you followed this story and the news at all, you will also know that in 2019, this same child's mother was shot by the Syracuse Police Department when she was having a mental health episode. Thankfully, she didn't die. But it is impossible for me to believe that having your mother shot by the police when you are five years old doesn't cause lifelong trauma and instill terror in you about contact with the police. Carol and her Facebook friends seemed to have missed all of this altogether because it wasn't just Carol. Several of her friends chimed in to agree with her post. Carol's white friend Julie wrote, I am sick of hearing how terrified this kid was. All I saw on that video was a temper tantrum. Here are what some of the other comments were from Carol's white, manliest-based friends. Norma wrote, I totally agree. Let him be scared straight. Her friend John said, boosting a bag of chips at 8, stealing cars at 12 if they don't have any repercussions. Linda's comment was, first a bag of Doritos, next a bicycle, years later a TV from Walmart, and more years later, a gun. Those police were doing this kid a favor. And her friend Donna's opinion was, he should be put in a detention center. The kids obviously got family issues and no proper supervision. Did you know that his mother was shot by the police because she attacked them? He shouldn't even be allowed out of the house. Why, I would have been grounded for six months, if not more. There were lots of other comments, too, lots of them, all, from what I could tell, from middle-aged white suburbanites, all of them self-righteous, and all of them attesting to the huge gift that this child had received at the hands of the benevolent Syracuse Police Department. All I could think of was it was as if they had watched an episode of The Brady Bunch in which Bobby had stolen a pack of gun, a pack of gum, and a kind, well-meaning cop played by any number of familiar character actors that we grew up with had delivered him home to the Brady's mid-century split level where Bobby would get a firm but fair lecture from a rather disappointed Mike Brady, right before sitting down to say grace while their maid Alice served up the pot roast and the mashed potatoes. All is forgiven, and you can rest assured, Bobby learned his lesson. In a way, in a way, you can't completely blame them. This is and has been, by and large, the reality that they live in. As white suburban baby boomers, they never had to fear the police. When they were eight, the police 
were dedicated public servants who kept the community safe and meted out firm but fair discipline when necessary. The people on this Facebook thread, I'm sure largely came from functional two-parent households where no one ever went unsupervised or hungry. And the thought that the police, the thought that the police might actually shoot mom would absolutely never, never occur to any of them. Think about this. Can you picture an episode of the Brady Bunch where Carol Brady gets shot by the police? Now, to be sure, not all of the people who commented on this post had led completely idyllic suburban lives. I have no doubt that there were at least a few who had divorced parents. There were probably likely a member or two of the bunch who had had an alcoholic or abusive parent, and probably not every one of these commentators was completely unfamiliar with financial struggle. But, because they had their pictures, they did all have one precious, precious, and protective quality in common. They were all white. And as white people, they grew up steeped in the unconscious assumptions of the privileged. I have no doubt, no doubt at all, that if any of these people watched a movie about slavery or about the Jim Crow era, they would instantly see the injustice and they would side immediately with the oppressed people of color. But here's the problem. Racism isn't that overt anymore, and so it's a little bit harder to see. It's cloaked largely in classism these days, and it's much more subtle in some ways, but it is just as unjust. It is just as unjust a form of segregation and oppression as it ever was. The rise of the suburbs after World War II provided an escape hatch for lots of white people, even those of fairly modest means. They could quietly move to their ranches and split levels on Songbird Lane or Rainbow Trail and live in a bubble of privilege where everyone was white, everyone was middle class, and the police existed solely, pretty much solely, to protect this bubble from being popped by anyone who was poor and especially by anyone who was brown. Within this bubble, life may not have been perfect, but life was essentially safe and fair and just, as long as you lived in the bubble and had white skin. And I believe that this segregation allows those of us who are white to live in the bubble pretty much all the time and to lapse into the habit of seeing things only through the eyes of other white bubble dwellers. I know that my friend Carol is a kind and generous and essentially just person. I know that she would speak out against overt forms of racism and discrimination. If, for example, the Fayetteville Manlius School District decided to adopt a separate but equal plan to segregate the students, I'm sure she would be outraged. She is probably one of the people, from what I know of her, that would speak out at a board meeting on the evils of racism. This is the problem with white bubble privilege. Even white people who are basically fair and liberal and justice-oriented often say and do things that are unconsciously racist, or if not racist, at least unconsciously white-centric. Carol saw the video of the eight-year-old boy, eight boy having contact with the police, and she saw it through her privileged lens. She saw it as well-meaning public servants teaching a naughty little rascal a valuable lesson which will keep him on the straight and narrow, just like an episode of My Three Sons. And her friends, from what I could see, all saw it the same way as well. I don't really know any of them, but knowing Carol and her husband as I do, and knowing the circles that they travel in, I'd be very surprised if anyone in that group of commenters was even close to the MAGA crowd. 
From what I know of her life, her friends are well-educated, affluent professionals who probably voted for Biden and would speak up if they were faced with any really blatant or overt form of racism. This is both encouraging and worrisome in equal measure. On the one hand, it's encouraging and good to know that these are people who are essentially fair and decent and justice-oriented. But on the other hand, it's troubling to me to see that in spite of these positive character traits, they are still apparently largely blind to the systemic racism that permeates American life and woefully lacking in self-awareness when it comes to the privilege that they enjoy. And lest I sound as if I am offering myself up to you this morning as the paragon of enlightenment, the person who never ever falls into the trap of exercising my white privilege, let me assure you that I am not. If those of us who identify as white are honest with ourselves, we will all recognize pieces of ourselves and the reactions of Carol and her friends. Most, if not all of us here this morning, have lived our lives essentially in similar bubbles that Karen, or Carol and her friends have lived in. If you doubt this, Imagine for a moment, just think about this, that you've been pulled over by the police. Or, if it's happened to you, reflect upon a time when you were. Were you treated with basic dignity? Now, I don't mean was the officer polite and friendly. They often are not. But was the discussion limited to the infraction that you had committed? You know, things like, do you know how fast you were going? Or, did you see that stop sign? Were you terrified to make any movement at all for fear that you would be shot? Did you reach into the glove compartment or your wallet or your purse freely to produce your license and registration? Or did you hesitate to do this for fear that your movement would trigger the officer to shoot you? Was your heart pounding with absolute terror over the horrible fate that might await you? Did you find yourself seriously considering that you were living the last seconds of your life and wondering what would happen to your spouse, your children, your parents, your pets? Were you ever told in a traffic stop, a routine traffic stop, to get out of the car? or to keep your hands where the officers could see them at all times? Were you ever handled or roughed up or even so much as touched by the officer? If the answer to most of these questions, or all of them, is no, then you have experienced and benefited from a form of white privilege. I will make a confession. I have a bit of a lead foot. And I have had many long commutes in my lifetime. And in 43 years of driving, I have been pulled over by the police at least 10 times, probably more, if I really counted every single one of them. On at least three of these occasions that I can recall, I've been simply let go with a friendly warning. The other times, I received tickets. A few times, the officers, yes, have been gruff and unwilling to let me speak much. But most of the time, they've been professional and polite, but firm. I have never once been asked to step out of the vehicle. I've never been asked to put and keep my hands where they can see them. I've always freely reached into the glove compartment and into my pocket to get my documents without giving any thought at all to how I was moving. To be honest, my principal emotion in these times has always been annoyance. I've never been fearful of anything other than my insurance rate going up. 
I've, thought, I've never once thought wistfully of Michael or Ollie, wondering if I'll ever see them again or what will happen to them when I'm gone. I have always navigated these traffic stops with a basic sense of entitlement to due process and fair treatment and an understanding that the worst thing that was going to happen to me was owing a fine. Annoying, definitely. Terrifying, never. That is white privilege. The simple assumption that you have the right to move freely and safely through the world, that you will be treated with a certain measure of dignity, and that the rules, while not perfect, are fundamentally fair to everyone. And added to this, the unquestioned assumption that everyone, everyone, experiences the world in more or less the same way that you do. That is white privilege. Our sacred duty as privileged but justice-oriented people is to cultivate an abiding and constant awareness that we live in a bubble of completely unearned entitlement and that the world is not experienced the same way by everyone. Further, it is absolutely imperative that we use the privilege that we have to fight for and advocate for those who live outside of the bubble. Kind, compassionate, just people have no other choice. We can't look the other way. We can't stay in the bubble. We have to work to pop the bubble. There is no higher calling and no greater purpose for our life energy than doing whatever we possibly can to further the cause of justice. Carol and her friends justified their reaction to the Doritos arrest as being in the child's best interest. A firm dose of discipline now will teach that kid to stay on the straight and narrow later. A good scare now, and like Bobby Brady or John Boy Walton, he'd never steal or break the law again. So they either forgot or conveniently ignored their own logic when a few days later, this same poor child was caught stealing a bicycle. Carol took to Facebook again to post, Hmm, according to this morning's headline, here's what that quote, scared little boy in the viral video was up to last night. And then she put the headline, eight-year-old involved in viral video with Syracuse police arrested in theft of bike. The same cadre of friends chimed in again, just as they did before, all of them united in their self-righteous condemnation of this child. Many of them also expressing sympathy for the long-suffering Syracuse Police Department for having to endure the unjust affliction caused by this thoroughly non-redeemable child. And so, at this point, I wanted to point out to them that they were imploding their own logic with every keystroke. But again, I refrained. As a person who has been a teacher for many years of emotionally disturbed children, I can assure you that yes, it is possible that children can learn from consequences, but, 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 only if these consequences are developmentally appropriate and in proper proportion to the offense committed. The situation in Syracuse met neither criteria. What happened instead was the re-traumatizing of a child who had already been severely traumatized by the shooting of his mother. The only lesson, the only lesson that trauma teaches is that the world is a scary, dangerous place in which we have no power, no safety, and no one cares. A society which feels justified creating this legacy to protect a 99 cent bag of Cool Ranch Doritos may be beyond redemption.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Go and hope, go and hope, for the arc of the universe is long and we can bend it toward justice. Go and courage, for together we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily lives and in the larger world. Go in love, because a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform our lives. And to this, let us say together a resounding amen.